Hello everyone, good day. I hope by God's grace you are all fine as I'm fine right now. Guess that I'm tired reading the articles. The articles are actually a lot, but we don't have any other option than to read. We read, we add whatever is being taught in class and tutorials, our personal notes. Then we try to make some recordings to also help others so that we can all pass and pass well. My name is Bafuwa Joseph Japon, but I'm popularly known as Nana Bafuwa, as you see on your screen, NBA. And I'm going to be your course instructor for this um, tutorial session that we are having. Is going to be based on the civil service and public service. So let's kindly um fasten our belts, relax, grab a popcorn or any fruit juice, some short diary as I walk you through the study of public and civil service. I hope you enjoy this particular session. So according to the Constitution of Ghana, the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, Article 190, Clause 1 and 2, A, says the public service shall include the civil service, judicial service, health service, educational service, parliament service, and so on and so forth. The B says it shall include other public corporations except those set up as commercial ventures. When we say businesses are set up as commercial ventures, it means their activities, their business activities are basically um, set up to aim profit. Example, the restaurant. You know, these restaurants that we have, they are there, although they are helping the people, but their primary goal is to gain profits in their business activities. And the public service will not work in favor of itself. It is selflessness. So if you are aiming to gain profits, that's, that means you are thinking about yourself, not the public. It means you cannot be a subset of the public service. So to clear the various argument that has been going on, the civil service is a subset of the public service. The public service is, a, is the broad or the mother of all the services. And it has birthed out the civil service, as I said in Article 190, um, Clause 1 and 2A, that the public service include the civil service, judicial health, educational, parliament, and so on and so forth. And we should know that all these services are constitutionalized. They are found and they are protected by the constitution. That's why I made reference to the, um, the 1992 constitution in my first summary. The civil service is uh, both exists at the central level and local level of, of, um, of a government of a decentralized government as it is being practiced in Ghana. The central level in the sense that we have civil services and civil servants who work at the national level, make broad policies and implementations over there. The, we have civil servants at the national level who assist the government, advise the government and other things at the national level. And we also have these same civil services at the local level, we also work at the grassroots area to um, bring policies closer to the people, to directly work hand in hand with the people at the local level. So the civil service, irrespective of how it is, um, we have civil services that are being found at the central level and also being found at the local level in a decentralized system of government. 
So that's the general overview of the civil service. I'm going to divide my lecture into various parts so that I don't merge all of them to confuse us. So that's an introductory session or submission of civil service. Let's now find the definition of civil service. When we are asked, what is civil service? What do you say? So civil service is a sector of government that consists of individuals who are employed by the government to perform various administrative, managerial, and professional rules. The civil service is a sector of government that consists of individuals who are employed by this same government to perform administrative, managerial, and professional roles. So they work in um, different government agencies and departments, providing public services to their citizens. These services can include um, a, um, healthcare, education, transportation, law enforcement, and more and more and more. So that's all about the definition of civil service. So civil service are being employed by this government to perform the managerial and professional and administrative roles of the civil service of the government. So the next subtopic is the code of conduct. I'm trying my possible best to make this discussion brief so that we'll be able to read the article. Let me um, fix in this advice, this short advice. Don't depend on the recordings that I'm sending to you or I'm posting. One way or the other, I'm helping all of us because I try my possible best to summarize everything and make it quite easier to understand in the YouTube videos that I make. But don't um, put aside the articles you've been assigned to read because I go through these articles, make my own notes, find important parts, then merge it with whatever is being taught in class and tutorial sessions, then I bring them here. That is why of late I've not been projecting slides because I cannot come and project the article and reading the article to us. It will make the lecture boring. So these are my personal notes that I've made from the article and other sources. So you listen to the record, you come to class, go through the articles and go to tutorial, then you get a full understanding. If you depend on my Recording so you are going to have an average preparation for the eyes and other exams and even your understanding in these kind of topics that we are talking about and you wouldn't get the desired results that you want. Please, success is the composite of several units and we must appreciate every factor. So let's appreciate every factor that will help us to gain academic excellence. In Jesus' name, amen. I know you've responded, amen. <laughs> so the next subtopic is the code of conduct of civil service. In section two of the Civil Service Act in the 1992 constitution, the number one function of civil service is to assist the government in the formulation and implementation of government policies. The number one function of the civil service is to assist the government in formulation and implementation of government policies. So that's the number one function. You could be asked what's the number one function of civil service? They assist the government. They initiate, the civil service initiates and formulates policy options known as policy formulation state. That is when debates goes on at their parliaments and they talk about it. I know in the policy cycle, this is the two that we are talking about. And they assist the government by um, advising the government. They do so, they initiate these policies 
they assist the government from in their formulation and implementation by advising them. When we say they assist them, what do they really do to assist them? They advise the government with whatever they are doing. They make necessary research for effective um, implementation of policy. You know, they will go and make this research because the governments are there and the civil servants are the ones working. So if the government has a, a project to embark on, they are going like three researchers. The civil service um, work under the educational um, administration or the Ministry of Education. They are going to sit down, make researches, the amount of money that we need to uh, spend on books, we need to spend on furniture, food and other things. They are going to make all these researches and plan them, submit it to the government that this is how we should do it to promote effective implementations. They also mm -hmm. review government policies and plan and evaluate them. I know we all know about this, the evaluation whereby they criticize and check the places that were not functioning properly. Then they, they go over it again, bring it to agenda setting, policy formulation, how to um, solve these problems and so on and so forth. That's the mode of conduct, the do's and don'ts of the civil service. And I've showed you that the number one function of the civil service is to assist the government in policy implementation and um, formulation. And they assist them by what? Giving advice, making necessary researches, and also reviewing and evaluating the policies of the government. In as much as I've talked about all these things about the civil service, there are also challenges of the civil service. There are some challenges that the civil service go through. Or there are some complaints about the civil service. And one of them is excessive bureaucracy, which leads to delay in policy. Excessive bureaucracy in the sense that when we want to implement a policy, it has to go through several stages. If you want to do something, you want to work hand in hand with an administration, you have to go through several process, writing letters, going to see this board committee and those kind of things to achieve that particular goal. And sometimes it may lead to um, the delay in policies in the sense that the, the, the time you needed that thing, because there is excessive bureaucracy, you have to go through a lot of stages. You are going to delay it, and by the time the resource is out, you may not need it anymore. It will be irrelevant to you. And that can cause ineffectiveness in our administration. That's one point. The second point, too, is favoritism and corruption. That is another major challenge or complaint about the civil service, whereby people are being employed by who they know, not what they can do. I know you, for example, I know you to be a friend. So in future, I've seen you. I know that you are my friend. But I wouldn't even check if you have the skills and abilities to perform such functions or perform the roles that I'm fixing you. Then I just mm -hmm. employ you because I know you. Then I will deny someone who have these quality um, skills and other things to function properly. Corruption. People also use illegal means to lobby administrators to fix positions. People use money. Others also pay in kind. You know what I mean when I say someone also pay in kind to get a job. People use various means to get this job. So there is no level of meritocracy whereby people are being employed by their merits, what they are capable of doing. But we therefore use favoritism and corruption in gaining jobs. Another major challenge is the tenure of office. These civil servants, they are there forever until they die or retire. So um, they are not being assessed to ensure effectiveness, but still we maintain them. Someone can be 
I, I can hold a position and know that there is no way he's going to be um, removed off or there's going to be an election or someone is going to step in for him or her. So he's just doing everything the way he or she wants. And they are not being assessed, but still we are maintaining them to be on this position and they can decide not to work effectively, although they are going to pay their fees. And that one too is a major challenge. And another key challenge is the use of special assistance. I remember Madame asked us what special assistance means and to that square make research. And by God's grace, this YouTube channel has provided an answer for special assistance. So when you are being asked in the exam that we teach people as special assistant, I think by the end of this lecture, we'll be able to give an answer. So special assistants are also political appointees. They, they work with the Minister of State. For example, the Minister of Finance, Minister of Education, Minister of Health. They serve as these um, experienced people who advise um, and plan certain things for the ministry they find themselves in. So when the Minister of Finance is being moved on, when there's an, a new Minister of Finance, these special appointees or special assistants will also go. But their main function is to uh, work hand in hand with the Minister of a particular ministry in performing its duties. And it is serving as a major challenge because it makes the structure of it broad if they are not there, we still have people who can also work together to promote effectiveness. But we appoint these people and we also pay money, kind of waste resources on them and other things. That's also one point. The next subtopic we are going to talk about is administrative reforms. Administrative reforms. So when we say reforms, what does it mean? The term reform can also be referred to as amendment, to make amendment, to reconstruct, to remodify, to modify, so modification. Thus, Another, um, there are synonym words to the term reforms. And what are some responses to reforms? Um, people don't normally like reforms because it, it affects them negatively. Like as I'm talking about the special, um, special assistance and those kind of things. If we are to make reforms and we are to remove them from there, they wouldn't like that reform because that's also one thing that is helping them to get money. They are being paid and other things. So if you are going to re do reforms and you are going to um, deny them of the opportunities that they are enjoying, I don't think they will also like what they will also like the reforms. So we do reforms because we we don't meet the uh, set target goals that we have what we have laid down. So we we do reforms in the course of a, during our evaluation. That for a classical example, when we came to school, maybe you had a goal that's level hundred. You want to get A's throughout. But by the end of the first semester, you are having some C, some B, and some Ds. So you do reforms. That is why you sit down. Then you say, how did I use my time? How, how should I learn? And should I reschedule or construct a new method of learning and those kind of things? That is why we do the reforms. We are doing the reforms because you have not met um, the goals that um, you, what you set. That is why we are doing reforms so right now when you see reforms you know something about reform so what is therefore administrative reforms 
administrative reform is making the right changes in our administrative work to meet the set target goals. Administrative reform, I take it again, is making the right changes in our administrative work to meet the set target goals. So after the administration, you see that, oh, we couldn't do these things. And um, what is the best way we think we can, we can do these things? That is what we do with the reforms. We amend certain things that we, we do, that we are supposed to do. Then we do what? We make these reforms in order to meet the set target goals that we want to achieve. So what are the features of administrative reforms? Or we say administrative reforms, they also have features. So one feature is collaborative. Administrative reforms are collaborative. That is when you collaborate with the people you are working with, you work hand in hand with them. There should be this level of collaboration whereby you tolerate and accept views of other people, ideas of other people, to what to work together to achieve a particular goal it should be deliberated. You should also you should also give authority power to certain people to take certain roles to perform certain um activities in order to ensure what effectiveness. So a simple history about the administrative reform is Nkroma created the SOEs to create employment, to develop and to serve as well. But they were in the end a cost on the nation. So there was a need for what reforms. We created these things to, so that uh, it will lead to employment, people so that people also serve well as well and also and um, develop the state. But by the end, they couldn't meet the set target goals. That is why there was a need for what? There was a need for reforms. That is when administrative reforms came about. So administrative reform came about um, in Ghana when in Gomez time, when you wanted to do some reform in the SOE sector. We also have trust of administrative reform. Trust of administrative reforms. Excuse me. Sorry. Trust administrative um trust of administrative reforms. So when we say trust of administrative reforms, we also have one privatization. Trust of administrative reforms can also serve as the features of administrative reforms. So privatization, that was when they they were they asked private sectors, or you ask private sector management to lead an SOE. SOE, they are public organizations, um, public positions. So privatization in the sense that you are asking this private sector management to also head certain SOEs in the country. That is privatization. You are promoting capitalism. We also have co-production to go into partnership to reduce um to produce goals together goals together co-production to go into partnership to produce goods together that is when you do certain corporations you collaborate with certain people it could be this private sector management or other public um organizations you go into partnership with them because you are making reforms you couldn't do things on your own. So this time around, let's partnership with this agency organization to what? 
to gain uh, to produce goods together and we seem to be able to produce enough goods to meet the needs of the people we also have debureaucratization debureaucratization that is reducing bureaucracy process as i said the challenges the excessive bureaucracy can be a, a, a challenge to civil service so you reduce the process if someone has to go through five stages to implement a policy it could be reduced to two or three in order to make policy implementation fast and what and quick so these are some points to under the trust of um, administrative reforms so the last but one subset under this topic too is how do we approach reforms how do we approach reforms there are various means to approach reforms. Um, the first one I'll talk about is total or comprehensive approach. A total or comprehensive approach. That means you are reforming all together. You are reforming all together. That's the basic thing about it. You see, there are some reforms that when you are doing, you take them step by step. Oh, let's work on this one first after that we come on this one. But the total or comprehensive, you are doing everything together in the organization. You are setting up new procedures, new rules, new things. You are doing everything all together. You also have implemental approach. That is the gradual process. That is the opposite of the total or comprehensive. Implemental approach, that is you are using gradual processes. You know that there are a lot of work to do, but you are doing it step by step. There are a lot of readings that you have to do, but you're not reading them all together, step by step. Oh, I'll do two readings each day. So, or oh, maybe I'll do two pages each day. So today I'm reading this page this morning in the evening, I'll read the second page. It is a gradual process. So by the end of the week, you might be done with the articles that you are supposed to what, read. We also have institutional base. Institutional base. These reforms um talks about specific laws, organization, or a law of a, a example is the law of inheritance. So specific laws mean um maybe in the constitution there are certain uh, specific laws that need to be amended. There are certain things that are not working in favor of the people. So you go directly to them, then you go and make reforms on them. There are specific organizations that, that are not working properly and you need um, to caution them or make some amendments or modifications um, on such in such organizations. So a specific or a institutional base, the institutional base approach talks about doing uh, specific things um, or doing the um, the exact things. So directly, specific laws, you open the constitution, maybe article 120 plus this A. This law is saying that you should cut human head when they get to age 20. They need amendment because they are not working in favor of the public. Then we go and amend those laws specific. These are institutional based approach in approaching reforms. Then the last topic is the hindrance of administrative reforms, the challenges. We can always talk about inadequate funds and resources. The inadequate funds and resources. You are sometimes you have um certain things that you want to do. You have the ideas that you want to do. You've made your policies, but in the policy cycle this stage, Paul talks about the policy implementation. That is the action part of the government. So if you want to make these reforms, that maybe you are building new roads and other things because you don't have good roads, then you need money to do them. And sometimes these 
um, public services or administrations lack enough resources to um, embark on such reforms. We also have change in government, which can also be a hindrance. When a government come, a government has a laid down agenda that they want to what they want to do, but they might not finish them. Then there will be a change of government. Then another party or another government will come. That government will have its own agendas and policies that they want to implement. So those policies that the initial government said will only be complete when they come back to office and decide to attend to them again. So maybe, for instance, if MPP was building a big airport at the northern region, then they didn't finish. Then NDC came to power, and NDC is now building a dam at the central region. The airport will still be there, although it's not finished. And no one will go and touch it until MPP comes back to power and try to complete that. That is also a big hindrance to administrative reforms. So I think that's the end of our lecture. And we've talked about the civil and public service. I gave you an, an overview of it that could be found in the Constitution, 1992 Constitution of Ghana, Article 120, Clause 1 and 2. He is saying that civil service is a subset of the public service. Health and judicial, education and parliament service are all subsets of the public service. And public service includes um, um, public corporations except those that are established for commercial ventures, that's to gain profit. We came down to know that the civil service can be found out both central and local governments or sector in the decentralized system of government. We've talked about the code of conduct, the number one function is to assist the government, and they do that by advising, making researches, implementation, policy implementation and reviewing the government policies and evaluations. And we looked at some challenges of civil service, that's excessive bureaucracy, mismanagement of resources, favoritism and corruption, tenure of office, and the use of special assistance. And another topic was on administrative reforms. We looked at we looked at, at the term reforms, meaning modification, amendments, restructuring, and other things. And people ideally don't like reforms because it can um no it, it will not be in favor of them. It will not save the interest of them because and I use the administrative um the use of special assistance as a classical example. But we do reforms to meet the set target goals and the definition for administrative reforms was the um, making right decisions in our administrative work to meet the set target goals. They are collaborative, they are deliberate. And we, we also talked about the trust of administrative reform, privatization, private sector management, organizing uh, managing or leading some public sector and um, organizations co-production go into partnership with other organizations to pro produce goods and services debureaucratization debureaucratization that's to reduce bureaucracy processes and we also talked about how to approach them, the approach total or comprehensive, doing all together. We also have to implement our approach, that's the gradual process. And we have the institutional piece, that's amending specific laws and other organizations. And the last subtopic was on the hindrance of administrative reforms, change of government, uh, inadequate funds and longevity of the reforms. 
that is all about that. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please listen to it and go through your notes and the articles. And I think you'll be fine for the various eyes that you have. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Bafo Ewa Joseph Ejapon. You can also call me Nana Bafo Ewa. I'm also a student like you. I'm in level 200 doing this YouTube video to help us so all. I don't know in the near future. I don't think I'll be in 200. Maybe I'll finish with school. But I think it is serving as a mark for other students. In 10 years' time, students who come to Legon can also have access to these videos when they get to 200 to help their education. We are also serving the public. I'm also a, a civil servant under the Ministry of Education indirectly because I'm also educating people one way or the other. And you're also helping me by watching the video. I really appreciate I appreciate the viewers and everything. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed. And kindly like the videos, please, I beg. I am on like the video, no? Video, oh dear, like, you know, like, and tap on the like like this, but it will not reduce your ability. It will not, it will, it can add some, but it will not reduce your beauty. But let's like if sometimes you see over 400 viewers, then you see 24 likes. Hey, so like you didn't like my English or I didn't teach you well. So let's kindly like and tell other friends. And please, someone should also help me. I want to get in contact with the um, city campus students so that they can also benefit from whatever we are benefiting from you. Thank you so much. I'm about to add another recording session. That is the um, the administrative law and ethics. I'm about to do that one so that we can also prepare enough. Thank you so much for listening to this episode.